Can you believe it's already been a year since I started the SNO love letter? Can you believe that I've spent almost two whole hours extolling the virtues of the show at this point? I mean, there are retarded monkeys with pencils that found their points quicker than I did. And if you think that that's crazy, then can you believe that even given all of that, that I'm not even halfway done yet? Can you believe there are major characters I've barely mentioned? Can you believe I've hardly touched anything past season one, which only accounts for about one-fifth of the story? Point is, I really hope those restraints are comfy, because this soapbox and I get along pretty well. So, the first major point of order, those crucial characters that I've barely mentioned, they would be Suguta, my pronunciation of which keeps flip-flopping, I'm aware, but I'm going to try and keep that consistent from now on. Mikiko and Astria. Well, going in order, Suguta I am actually going to say for later, because it isn't really until the last few chapters of the manga that his art gets fleshed out, so I'll save him for, like, part 2000 or whenever. The only things you need to know right now are that he's a nerd who lives in a tent down by the river for as of yet unknown reasons, and who is obsessed with finding out the truth of the synapse. Next up, Mikiko, who I adore. So, flashback to part two of the love letter. In that video, I talked about how Sumonizuki uses traditional anime cliches as a foundational element in almost all of his characters, but then proceeds to add depth and complexity to them as time goes on. Well, following in those footsteps, Mikiko's cliché is that she is the classic Ojo-sama archetype, the kind who always talks in a very polite yet somewhat airheaded manner as a blatant way to disguise some character flaw, generally that they're secretly just as scared as everyone else is or feel isolated or what have you, and will almost always have some sort of authoritative position in the school, usually being the student council president or at the very least having a lot of money. Now, all of that does certainly apply to Mikiko, so how does she evolve the cliché? Well, here's the thing. She doesn't so much evolve the cliché as the rest of the cast do, as she does subvert it completely for the sake of comedy. So, as you would expect, Mikiko does put on an affable outward persona, but it's not to hide that she's lonely or lost and scared inside or whatever. Now. It's to conceal the fact that she is secretly the most evil human being in the entire history of the universe, which is hilarious. You see, Mikiko's influence comes from the fact that her father is the head of the Yakuza, which gives her both infinite money and a no-holds-barred get-out-of-jail-free clause for any of her extremely sadistic whims. She adores torturing people for her own amusement, to the point that she regularly throws entire tournaments with million-dollar prizes just because she's bored and it'll make Tomoki suffer in the process. Now, Mikiko very rarely interacts with the plot side of the show, except by just physically being there when important things are happening, which is totally fine with me. I mean, not everyone needs to be critical to the plot, you know? Anyways, the purpose of Mikiko's character is almost exclusively to drive comedy, whether that be by her actions in a more personal sense, or by hosting a festival and just providing an excuse for absurdist comedy to transpire. The only things you really need to know about her is that she exists, that she and Suguta were childhood friends, and that for some reason, her Yakuza clan holds Suguta in very high regard. And by the way, speaking of Mikiko and the Yakuza, Cool little detail number 1972, in the scenes where Mikiko isn't at school, you can almost always spot a Yakuza member in the background, either doing her bidding or keeping an eye on her from afar to make sure she's safe. And finally, that brings us to the most plot-critical character that I've neglected thus far, the close combat specialist angeloid, type Delta, Astria. And what's this, you might be saying? There's another main character, Angeloid, and you're only just now mentioning her? And why didn't you bring her up when talking about Tomoki's love interests in part four? Well, those questions have complicated answers, or I guess simple answers with complicated explanations. First of all, yes, I am basically only just now talking about her, 
And the reason for that is, well, put it like this. When I was reading the manga, I really didn't like Astria. If you would ask me around, ooh, let's say chapter 60, and keeping in mind the manga is only 80 chapters long, which of the characters I had disliked the most at that point, I would have told you it was a tie between Sahara and Astria. Now, neither of them are awful characters. Well, Sahara's pretty bad, but around that time, they both just felt pointless in regards to the overall plot and story. Like here. Tell me if you've heard this one before. When an angeloid who is bound to Mino shows up on Earth, she thinks that humans are nothing more than bugs to be squashed, and is on a mission to kill Tomoki, and it's made clear that she'll be killed if she fails. She starts off acting hostile towards him, but eventually gets roped into wacky comedy hijinks, except literally with the rope this time, and eventually gets won over by Tomoki, ending with her defecting and getting her chain cut. Hmm, where have I seen that before? So, pretty much from the word go, Astria just felt like a repeat of something the show had already done before and done better with Nymph, and so it was always one of the lesser characters in my mind. Now, thankfully, she does improve a lot later on, as I'd wager, like, 90% of her unique character development happens in the last fifth of the manga. So Hora still sucks, though. Personality-wise, Astria's main thing is that she's stupid, and as such, for a very long time, is really much more centrally in the comedy camp of the show than either Icarus or Nymphar. But for me, the real defining moment of Astria's character is exactly how she gets set free from Minos by breaking the chain herself. Now just keep in mind, angeloids are hardwired pretty much from birth to want to serve a master, to the point that even when Nymph was about to die because of her chain, the thought of breaking it didn't even occur to her. So Astria doing this herself, and really without anyone prompting her to, says a boatload more about her character than any surface level, oh, she's just dumb, glib remark ever could. She's not traditionally intelligent, yeah, but she is a very earnest person despite being really bullheaded and who, when she's forced to get serious, isn't afraid to take charge of the situation. Unfortunately, as I said, we don't get to see much of her interacting with the plot until towards the end of the manga, so despite being a pretty good character, Astria does tend to fade into the background for the majority of SNO's run. And as for why I didn't include her in the love interest thing in part 4, well, this might be a bit death of the author on my part, but I never got the sense that Astria was in love with Tomoki. Like, skip to any random scene of the two of them interacting, and it'll almost certainly be them playing a game together, or generally goofing around in a comedy episode. Like, when I think of Tomoki and Astria's relationship, I always got the impression they were just really good friends as opposed to love interests, which is why I don't consider her a harem candidate, despite the manga's sort of token attempts to insist that she is one. So, thus ends my look at the characters that I've only sort of glazed over until now, which means that you, yes you, know everything that you need to know to watch the second half of this video series, but more on that in a bit. In the meantime, I want to wrap up a few other lingering threads on Season 1 and Forte before we leave. Something that I cannot believe I haven't mentioned until now is how fucking amazing all the music in SNO is. I mean, I've said before that every single one of SNO's 25 end credit sections had different animations and a new song, but I didn't really go into just how good the vast majority of those songs are. From the beautifully solemn acoustic guitar duet in the first ED, to the hilarious insanity of episode 5's Kawaguchi Hiroshi, to the heart-rending and soul-crushing ED from episode 12, which I actually want to talk about in detail for a bit. So, this ED almost immediately follows Nymph's decision to allow herself to die as she flies off into the mountains. And as I've said before, I had hated Nymph when she first showed up and acted like just a boilerplate tsundere, but after seeing her transformation in the previous episodes and having been really won over by her personality, this ending theme made me reflect on my initial hatred of her with a sort of sorrowful, melancholic regret. 
which combined with it just generally being a really sad scene, this was actually the first of many times that SNO would make me cry. And I think it was while watching this exact scene right here, when I was 13 and had tears streaming down my face, that the exact magnitude with which SNO had just eclipsed every other anime that I had ever seen finally hit me. But it's not just the endings that are great. The actual background music of the show is equally fantastic. Or at least, I think it is. Yeah, this is one of those situations where I have a really hard time divorcing my personal bias from what I'm talking about. Because I have rewatched SNO so many times at this point that it is entirely possible my high esteem for the OST is a result of Stockholm Syndrome. So you'll have to be your own judge of this, but I don't think you can argue that when SNO wants to sound good, that it doesn't succeed. Even the stuff that sounds like the kind of music you'd get in other shows is just the best possible version of that kind of song. Take, for example, something as simple and uplifting as the Sarami Town theme. And there's a ton of other great ones, too. The New World Discovery Club theme, Mikiko's character theme, the oh shit, important things are happening right now theme, and we could hardly forget Ikaros' show-stopping performance of Fallen Down from episode 10. But my personal favorite song on the whole OST is actually from season 2. Now, before I show it to you, I want you to imagine the kinds of songs that harem comedies usually have. Wacky, uplifting, simple beats, maybe the occasional sad song, you know, the kind of stuff I've been showing you so far. Well, imagine you've just watched 13 episodes, hearing almost exclusively music like that, and then, in the very first episode of season two, the characters discover the rule, and it's introduced with this. <laughs> I've had friends say that it sounds like some generic battle theme off the Halo soundtrack or something, so I just really can't stress how much better this is made by the previous 13 episodes sounding nothing like this. It evokes a sense of grandiose wonder, coupled with extreme sadness, that I fondly remember pulling me up by the collar, smacking me in the face, and making me pay attention to shit. Oh, and also, the name of that song is Synapse No Sakai, which either can be read as The World of Synapse, or Synapse is the World. And of course, I could hardly talk about the music of SNO without mentioning how fucking amazing the opening Ring My Bell is. I can honestly say that it is still my favorite OP of all time. Just, the song is so good! Every time an episode opens up with that song, I get unbelievably hyped for what's about to come. And of course, it wouldn't be SNO if they didn't pour a ridiculous amount of effort into the small details that nobody appreciated. And this wouldn't be the SNO love letter if I didn't force your nose into those details until you give the show the proper level of worship and devotion. So, usually the OP has Yoshida Hitomi doing the main vocals, with Ikaros' voice actor, Sayori Hayami, doing the backup lines. 
But in the OP for episode 11, they actually switch places, with Yoshida Hatomi doing the backing lines, while Ikaros' VA does the main vocals. Then, in episode 12, they decide to add in sound effects, because why the fuck not, right? And then, and this is the most impressive of all, by the way, episode 1 of season 2 starts off with a remake of season 1's OP, except with Tomoki and Ikaros' place, which is fucking hysterical! Also, I'd uh, like to point out where his wings are growing from. Yeah. Anyways, Season 2 has its own opening, and another really good one, actually. But because SNO is just the best anime ever made, they made an entire joke opening that obviously had a ridiculous amount of effort poured into it and played it only in Episode 1. Godspeed, AIC Asta. Godspeed. So, unfortunately, we now have some unpleasantness to cover. I said in part one that Heaven's Lost Property was my favorite anime ever made, but unfortunately, it'd probably be more appropriate to refer to it as my favorite manga ever made, because for while most of its run, the anime is almost a 100% faithful adaptation of the manga, about halfway into season two, things turn bad. Really bad. Like, fucking atrociously, horrifically, nightmarishly bad. Yeah. So, I'll just let you guys know right now, part seven, where I discuss what went wrong and why, is probably going to be like an hour-long video or something ridiculous, which will take me forever to make. So, in the meantime, I figured that now is the perfect time to leave off with a watch guide. If you've been waiting for me to finish the thesis before watching SNO, now is the time that I would urge you to stop and watch the actual anime for yourself. And if you want to avoid the bad bits I'm talking about, here is exactly what you have to do. First of all, season one is totally fine. Feel free to watch all of that and even the OVA. Then watch season 2, Forte, until the ending of episode 9, and stick around for the credits of that episode because there's actually an awesome scene afterwards. Then, after you have finished episode 9, switch to the manga and start reading either at chapter 32, which will cover the episode you just finished watching to help acclimatize you to the change, or, if you don't need that, you can pick it up at chapter 33 instead, which is where the story will continue properly. And read it from there until the ending of the manga at chapter 77. I've taken the liberty of putting a link in the description to where you can read the whole thing, but if that's gone down sometime in the future, then just type in Sorano Tashimono Manga into Google, and you'll find something, I'm sure. Also, little tip here, try to stick to Fool Rules' or Renzokusei's translations, because they were by far the best. If you watch SNO in that order, you will see only the good bits with none of the bad, and will freely be able to experience one of the best stories ever told. But if you don't, if you watch the anime to its conclusion, you will find one of the most poorly thought out, horribly written, botched adaptations of a fantastic franchise to ever exist. Most everyone who has seen the SNO anime agrees that it eventually gets bad, but it's often the subject of debate as to when exactly that happens. Some say that it's only the second movie that was horrible, whereas others say you can see the problems as far back as the first. But no, in this fan's not-so-humble opinion, the true point at which the timelines diverge and the anime dives headfirst into the pits of hell itself Dooming the franchise for all eternity is with the ending of Forte. So, dear viewers, brace yourselves for what's to come.
because things are about to get a little chaotic. Continued in part seven. <laughs>